ITQ Podcast, episode 418, Spy Radio and Parasets. Well, hello, fellow amateur ham radio enthusiasts, and welcome to this, our 418th episode of the ICQ Amateur Radio Podcast, supported in this episode by our monthly and subscription donors. In this episode, we join Martin, M1RB, Dan, Kilo Bravo 6, November Uniform, Karen, KD2, Golf Uniform Tango, Edmund, Mike Zero, Mike, November Golf, and Ed, DD5, Lima Papa, to discuss the latest amateur ham radio news. Myself, Colin M6BOY, rounds up the news in brief. And this episode's feature is an interesting conversation and covering uh, spy radio and parasets. Well, as always, it's your very kind generosity that keeps your ICQ podcast advert free. And we couldn't do this show uh, the way we do without that support. We obviously thank our monthly subscription donors who, uh, as I say, set up uh, uh, recurring payments to us to help us out along the way. And we'd encourage you to do the same by visiting icqpodcast.com forward slash donate, where they say whatever you send away goes towards the running costs of the show. There's only one more show between now and Christmas if you wish to send in your uh, donations for the end of year, and we would really appreciate anybody that considers that for us. Right, well, now we're going to join Martin, Dan, Karen, Edmund, and Ed to discuss and generate thoughts about the latest amateur ham radio news, including Ofcom helps to convict an interferer, and FunCube 1 is 10 years old. As always, hope you enjoy. The ICQ Podcast Digital Voice Talk Group. Your digital home away from home. Worldwide. Well, hi guys, and welcome to the ICQ podcast, uh, episode 418, and tonight's news round table for that episode. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Mr. Dan Romacek, KB6NU. Hi, Dan. Hello, everyone. Good to have you on board. Also, your side of the pond, we have Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT, getting your call sign right yet again, Karen. Hi, Martin. Good to be back. Yeah, good to have you. And I know I you often used to say GD2 and put you in Guernsey, but uh, good, good one. No, no, Isle of Man, isn't it? Isle of Man. I'm having a, I'm having a, a moment as well. Okay, over in Germany, we got Mr. Ed Durant, DD5 LP. Hi, Ed. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Yeah, good evening. And last but not least, down here on the south coast, where it's always sunny when he's wandering up and down the beach with his uh, Yagi pointing it all over the place, uh, Ed Spicer, uh, M0 MMG. Hi, Edmund. <laughs> good evening, Martin. Good evening, everybody. And it's not sunny here on the south coast, but we haven't had any snow. But I was talking to a colleague, I think, in County Durham earlier, and they've had a dusting of snow up there. And a uh, call sign starting Golf Delta 2 would be extremely rare indeed. So uh, if you ever hear one of those on the air, try and work them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as I say, I often... Uh, put Karen in the early days I could never remember the call sign and often uh, <laughs> relocated her to the Isle of Man so uh, <laughs> yeah there we go anyway let's start our first news story and in fairness this is not a nice news story but at least it proves that we don't only pick on the states when the FCC convicts somebody for being a pain and causing interference to amateur radio so, Ed, you said this is your part of the world where you grew up, but what's your thoughts? Yeah, indeed it is. Um, this is a non-licensed person who was deliberately causing interference uh, to amateur radio in the Hull area in, in East Yorkshire. And the it seems this was his second offence from what the article says, but this particular offence was a response from Ofcom to complaints in February in 2021. So it's taken them like two and a half years to get this guy to court, but uh, at least they've, they've taken some action. Uh, we were discussing earlier the uh, his, his actual punishment doesn't seem to be very hefty, but at least the regulator is doing something, which 
it's good to see that they're they're responding to complaints and uh, investigating, and in this case, taking it to the courts and uh, getting the guy uh, prosecuted. It's a real shame when you got idiots like this around. And I was saying earlier on, uh, back when I used to live there, it would have been more likely that somebody would have gone round. Uh, to this guy's door and just had a few words with him and maybe invited him to the club but he was perhaps past that stage in this case and yeah he's uh, ending up uh, he's on a suspended sentence but if he does anything wrong in the next 12 months he'll go to jail for 26 weeks but I think the key point is that uh, Ofcom the the national regulator in the UK is actually uh, doing some enforcement when there is interference to amateur radio Back to you, Martin. Yeah, they certainly are. But I suppose his sentence is not set by the regulator, Ofcom. So if no, he's no. got in the court, that's what the judge has given him. And, yeah. you know, 26 weeks suspended sentence. Okay, doesn't seem much. I would suggest he's had his uh, gear, conf- all his gear confiscated. Mind you, if that was, say, a Balfang, a £20 handy talkie because he was interfering on a repeater, not a lot of money he's lost there either. But, hey, hum. Karen, you didn't think it was uh, sufficient of a fine, did you? No, I, I want to start by saying I, I think it's great that uh, the authorities went after him. I don't think people should be let off easily. They should be taken to task. But, no, I actually think it was a cop-out, a prison sentence with no financial sanction, uh, and a prison sentence that is suspended, to me, is meaningless. I read that story and I thought, well, why bother? You know, you're not even slapping him on the wrist, really. You're, you know, putting him in front of the classroom and embarrassing him, and that's about it. And to me, that says that while, yes, people are being called out for this kind of behavior, um, amateur radio should be taken a little more seriously than uh, than that. Now, I know here in the States, we we have the, the FCC exacting some fines that are absolutely astronomical. They, they look like telephone numbers. And there's always a question of, well, <laughs> do they ever really collect the fines? And that's that's and that's the other side of it. I want to be fair and say, uh, I don't remember running any stories on Newsline saying that these fines were collected. And I know it takes some time to do that. But just the same, I think if you're going to call people out for being uh, this way on the air toward the licensed amateur radio community, for goodness sake, put some real teeth into it. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, I suppose you you are right, but having uh, experienced a completely different thing where uh, I took somebody to court who owed me some cash for a job I did, you it's very difficult to recover things. And if the person said he, you know, he hasn't got any money, the big fines you have in the states, you know, you can have a big fine. But if the person says I haven't got any money, I'll pay you x dollars a month for the next 500 years they're making the offer and probably get away with it that 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 would probably sort of set the courts okay with it in the uk probably not over where you are damn what's your thoughts well i think that would be a very interesting story to see if uh, any of those fines were collected over here by the fcc and or the justice department but uh, as far as far as um, this goes I heard Riley Hollingsworth talk one time. Riley Hollingsworth was head of the enforcement division at the FCC for a while. And now he's the uh, head of the ARRL's volunteer monitoring program. And anyway, what he said he used to do, and I thought this was great actually, what he said he used to do was actually contact the spouse of the offending interferer and make sure that the uh, spouse knew what the person was up to. And to me, that would be, be a pretty, pretty bad fine, <laughs> you know, getting your, your wife or husband uh, 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 coming down on you for, uh, for doing something so silly as. Edmund, 
What's your thoughts on this one? I mean, it is a UK, and we are being fair by uh, you know mentioning that the, these problems happen in the UK as well, aren't we? What do you think on this one? Well, when I read this, I was genuinely surprised because in the nearly 15 years that I've held a license now, I don't ever remember hearing a story quite like this where Ofcom was involved. Um, I've heard tales of where they supposedly have contacted people and offered friendly, informal words of advice and correction going down the education and encouragement route rather than the uh, the punishment route. And given that in common with most government departments and executive agencies, I would imagine they're not overflowing with resource. For them to be involved in something like this, this must have been extremely serious. So congratulations to all involved in actually getting this to court. I, I just think it's such a shame and I don't understand why anybody would do this and and certainly not in a public venue like the amateur radio airwaves where you're likely to come to the attention of other people. And what makes it even more sad is that um, it doesn't actually say in the article which bands this this chap was using but if he was using repeaters then if he has the wherewithal and the knowledge and the skills to program in to his radio repeater shifts deviation split frequencies ctcss tones then it's likely that he wouldn't have too much trouble passing the foundation license and i'm not saying that as a slight on foundation license holders at all so i just don't get it i mean this is not whatever your definition of normal is this is not normal behavior and i hope that he will get the help that he clearly needs be that psychiatric or medication or or whatever but well done to Ofcom for getting involved and uh, helping to secure the conviction. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. Um, you know, it's nice to see that Ofcom is doing it. And in fairness, for our cousins in other parts of the world, you know, I, I we've we've highlighted things happening in other parts of the world. And I think, although it's a, a bad news story, I think it was important that f- from a fairness point of view, we... Uh, we highlight that it does happen here as well. Right, moving to our next news story. Happy 10th birthday to CubeSat 1, brackets AO73. Yeah, it went up uh, November the 21st, 2023. Dan, I, I assume you might have done some satellites. I'm not sure. But what do you think about this? 10 years for a satellite. That's pretty damn good going, isn't it? To be honest with you, I've only made one satellite contact in the past. But but I think that the cool thing about this fun cube is that it was put up with um, education in mind. You know, all the other ones, yeah, you know, they throw them up there and people make contacts with them, and that's that's great. But you know, there were a lot of uh, uh, cool uh, educational projects that went along with this fun cube, if I recall. And I think that's the the real um, uh, I don't know value of of this particular satellite in ten years. That's that's just uh, just gravy. Yeah, certainly is because you know you would we didn't have the mega mega resources that say NASA would have for putting up a satellite. This is amateurs. This is probably done off for people from their own pocket, a group. That, uh, got a bit of sponsorship and they've done really really well so uh, that uh, to me to me is a big one and you're right it was educational i mean i remember i've got um i've actually got two fun cube dongles and you could monitor this satellite as it went over and download its telemetry and it used to send messages out to schools 
as it went over. And then at some point in time, they switch it over to make it an amateur repeater as well. But brilliant little satellite. Karen, what's your thoughts? Well, um, I don't really do very much work with satellites. I actually don't do any work with satellites. But, of course, we run a lot of stories about them, and uh, there are a lot of them out there. And they keep adding more and more satellites. So hearing that this one has this kind of terrific longevity gives me hope that maybe if satellites can achieve this kind of longevity over time, there won't be such a need to fill the sky with so much space junk uh, because we are having a problem. I'm not calling this satellite junk. It isn't junk, but we do have a disposal problem. And I'm seeing that something like this can be made to last. Uh, and I wish more of them had this kind of lifespan because there'd be fewer collisions or near collisions or potential collisions out there. But happy birthday, FunCube. I, I think it's a nice achievement. And uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad we're talking about this because it's. Uh, it's a good example of how to do things right. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, yeah, it certainly is. And I'm looking at this Edmunds and I'm thinking it's saying it's done more than 53,500 revolutions of the Earth. I mean, and they're suggesting it's done over 1.3 billion miles of travel, you know, it's phenomenal. It's been been w working its way up there. I mean, even I, I know you haven't done a satellite, but but um, this was certainly one worth listing out for. And they've done some really good work on this one, Edmund. What do you think? Well, the, the only thing I've not succeeded in doing is actually putting a signal through a satellite and working anybody, um, which is shameful because i've owned a elk log periodic antenna for years and years and years and ostensibly that is designed for contacts through satellites works great for working people terrestrially as well which is what i've been using it for but in terms of reception i fared a lot better mainly signals from the international space station but i do quite like regularly um listen to signals coming down from the, the various FM satellites, including um, in years gone by AO73. And I just can't believe it's been 10 years. That is frightening how quickly that's gone. It doesn't seem that long ago that they'd only just launched the thing and did the uh, 73 on 73 award, where if you worked 73 stations through the satellite, you could uh, get a certificate, I seem to remember. So maybe if uh, the great and the good at AMSAT are listening to this, they might consider doing something similar for uh, the, the satellite's 10th uh, uh, birthday. But other than that, there's nothing I can say other than uh, congratulations and a very happy birthday to AO73. Yeah, it'll be a good one, and I've uh, certainly listened to this one. Now, Ed, one of the things you were saying and you picked up, it was the first CubeSat, the very first one, which uh, quite impressed you, didn't it, Ed? Yeah, this is, coming back to what, what, what Karen was saying, the fact that this satellite, which was intended to be educational in the first, uh, realm and then amateur as a second is uh, the the standard one u one unit uh cubesat size and it was the first one to go up there have been hundreds or even thousands of uh satellites since that have followed the same specification and this is a lot smaller satellite than we used to have you know if you go back and compare this to something like AO7 from the 60s which is still operational on and off. It, this thing's probably about a tenth of the size. You know, it, it's really small and it was a big success. And let's just point out, this is still operational. This is still doing everything it's supposed to. We so often have 
stories about satellites high that okay it's gone up and it's in orbit and it's working or it's burning up and coming down this one is 10 years up there and still going strong so i mean that says an awful lot for the technology in it back in 2013 okay we uh, we we obviously had surface mount components and things then but uh, even so you know 10 years up in space uh, for anything any electronics it's it's amazing and yeah it's still up there it's still doing its thing and yeah long may it uh, stay there and uh, it, it it set a standard that others followed including commercial satellites in one new format back to you martin yeah yeah well as i say great little satellite to listen to and uh, you can download the uh, telemetry of it or monitor the telemetry and all those sort of things and uh, well worth a look uh, guys if you uh, have the time just set up and monitor it great little satellite that one okay amateur radio in the news well, it was because I nicked it straight off Dan's website and it said that there's a club poter activation and soter activation and Jota Skywarm in Notts County, TN. Now, I got all excited because the next line it said Sussex County and I thought our Edmund would, lives in Sussex, in the county of Sussex. And then realised it obviously it was a state story. So uh, <laughs> sorry, Edmund, but Dan, you know you put this one up. Great news, isn't it? That the club's doing all this sort of thing. Yeah, and I think the uh, the the neat thing about this story is that other clubs might want to read it and then sort of emulate this. And you know, it shows that this club has really integrated itself with the community. So it's, 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 you know, doing all these different things. And that, I mean, that's got to be good for the club. It, it gets the club out into the community. People find out about it. People that are, have licenses and uh, are, are not that active, that might motivate them to join the club and get more active. So it's a, it's a good thing all the way around, I think. Yeah, I think it's good when a club gets out there and does things. And, uh, you know, at the moment, there's a lot of apathy in the hobby, but to see a club doing things like this really does impress me. So, um, Ed, what's your thoughts on this one? It's a good model for uh, other clubs to follow. Uh, multiple outside activities, get the club members involved and get a lot, uh, get the local press involved as well because this is what this is Cape, Cape Gazette, Delaware's Cape region. So the regional newspaper came along and they've got p pictures of their uh, emergency operations uh, van as well. And, yeah, it's basically what a lot of clubs would do on a field day, I guess. But why not do it at a different time of year and get some uh, publicity for your club? And... Uh, you know, get all the club involved. It looks like there's quite a few young members in this club as well, so they're obviously doing something right. Uh, back to you, Martin. Yeah, I'm quite impressed with what they're doing. So, uh, all be it here. Uh, Karen, I know you have a go at Poter, and uh, this this must have uh, quite uh, excited you seeing uh, a club pushing this sort of thing. Oh, you're reading my mind, Martin. I was very excited to see this. Um, this is what clubs should do. Uh, really, it really is what clubs should do. Here's the thing. A lot of us will join clubs and we will want to do activities and we don't know where to start. Okay. My first POTA activation was with a club and I couldn't have gone out and done this myself. I don't know where to begin. I'm, I operate from home. Okay. And this was not even, it'll be a year next month that I'm doing POTA, just a year. But I got an amazing jump start on it because I had club members around me saying, no, this is what you do with this antenna. This is what you, this is how you put your key. And it's like, sometimes you just need somebody to walk you through it the first time and to give you a sense of the pitfalls and to let you know what to expect if members of the public come by, uh, whether it's POTA, whether it's SOTA, you know, uh, Skywarn. We, 
we all need somebody to hold our hand the first time. I do a lot of my POTUS solitary. It's more fun with people. That's the other thing I just want to say. When you do it as a club, it's great because let's face it, food is usually involved and who doesn't like to eat? But if you're going to try to do solitary for whatever reason, scheduling issues and other, other concerns you have, what a great way to help your club and its members discover what they enjoy doing. A whole variety of things, POTA, SOTA. We don't have summits around where I live, but if there were summits here, I would want to do it with a club. So great for this Delaware club. I, I think they're onto something really, really good. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, I'd like say it's all positive, and this is getting out in the field. It's showing amateur radio to the public. It's an opportunity to talk to them as they go by. So uh, all in all, I think it's a brilliant one. Edmund, I'm guessing that uh, you may have had a go at Potter and Sota, uh, but I know you certainly do go out operating portable quite often. So what's your thoughts? Well, I was really confused for about five seconds because I saw Sussex mentioned and Kent mentioned as well. But then I thought, no, that can't be right. It's in the USA rather than the, the south of England. So I looked into it a bit more deeply and discovered that both those counties are in Delaware. I think that's right, isn't it? I think so. I think so. And I was half hoping that there might be a, a Hampshire, Surrey or Essex right next to those counties as well. But I looked on the map and there isn't, sadly. The only SOTA activation I've ever done was on 2 metres FM from Campbell Hill when we visited uh, Dayton in 2019. I've not done a POTA and I really should get around to it one of these days because I could actually walk from my front door up to High Down Hill, which is just about in the South Downs National Park. It's about two and a bit miles each way. So one of these years, I will organise myself and take part in POTA. But beyond that, yes, I agree with what's been said already. Activity has a, a habit of breeding activity. And this club is certainly setting a good example, isn't it, Martin? Yeah, it certainly is. And maybe one day, uh, when it gets a bit warmer... Maybe I'll come down and we'll go up that park not far from you because I've been there. It's uh, it's an interesting place. If I remember right, there's some picnic tables up on the downs there that we can operate from quite nicely, uh, which will be quite good. So all being all, that's uh, good to see a club out there showing uh, showing amateur radio in a good light. Our next news story, and this one came up late karen you put it in uh, i didn't know about this but this is a real tragedy that fire has swept through nikola tesla's test remaining lab so uh, yeah let's hope they can save some of it karen over to you yes uh this is a beautiful property historic property here in new york in this part of new york east of new york city in a community called Shoreham in Suffolk County, another another name that has been purloined from the old country. And here in Suffolk County, about 30, 30 minutes east of my QTH is this beautiful building that is the last remaining laboratory of Nikola Tesla. And this is a much loved site uh, for the immediate community. They, they know it's historic importance. Um, it's being developed right now redeveloped by a nonprofit to become a educational science center honoring Nikola, Nikola Tesla for his work. And there will be a very strong amateur radio component on the site. Well, a couple of days ago, fire broke out and swept through the main building, which is the laboratory. A uh, really horrendous fire. 100 volunteer firefighters responded because here our firefighters are all volunteer from the community mainly uh, to try and bring this fire down. Fire is out. The damage is horrendous. Thank God no loss of life. But now what we have 
uh, what we have on this property is uh, a 20 million dollar project that is now got an additional expense for repair in the millions three million and that's on top of the fact that they're still six million dollars short of meeting the 20 million dollar goal i contacted them because uh obviously we wanted to know first of all do they know yet what caused the fire thankfully not suspected to be arson so there doesn't seem to be any malice toward this uh toward this project but my concern especially for newsline readers and newsline listeners uh is well what happens now uh to the amateur radio activity that's supposed to be there the good news there is there is a visitor center on the property it's in a separate building and that's being redeveloped as a visitor center and that was not affected by the fire so the plans for amateur radio will continue to go forward and the little amateur radio club that's going to be housed there will be able to grow and flourish educate people and have some nice public activities and in fact i was i was told this morning by um ed wilson and to xdd that they're probably going to have a tree lighting ceremony on the property somewhere uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday, December, first Saturday in December. So the bottom line is this is going to be expensive to repair, but there is a worldwide fundraising effort to get enough to get this up and running and to fix things. And the good news is, yes, it will happen. It may happen a little later now because of the damage, but it can be saved. So definitely a tragedy, but fortunately, a happier future, we hope. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, well, you put it very well, Karen. And I think I think I, that, uh, you know, Tesla was one of the, the big greats and, to do with radio and early on. And, you know, the Tesla coils and things like that were fun. So I hope they do manage to uh, at least rebuild this lab and make it open for visitors going forward. Dan, what's your thoughts? Well, I think uh, Karen's covered it pretty well. It's good that the plans are going to go ahead, and um, I just urge everybody to support them. Yeah, I think so. I think it'll be a good one. So, Ed, what's your thoughts on this one? Yeah, the only thing I'd query, because they've ruled out arson, that suggests that the fire originated in the area where the renovation work was taking place. If that was being done by an external company, they should have insurance. You know, the, uh, they still haven't, Karen was saying earlier offline that uh, they still haven't got a final answer of what actually caused the fire. But if it turns out to be negligence on the part of the, the building workers or the renovators, one would hope that their insurance would be able to pay for the $3 million of damage that they've done, or at least towards it, if not all of it. But, uh, you know, uh, unless it was volunteers doing that renovation work, in which case, of course, there's no insurance. Terrible, terrible news, but uh, the positive news is it can be saved, and also very positive news is nobody was injured. So, uh, you know, bad, bad time, but uh, could have been a lot worse. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, I think you made the right point that uh, there was no loss of life and nobody got injured. Uh, going to be a great loss, but if they can rebuild it and they can refit it out uh, back to its original state, then uh, let's hope they can. Edmund, what's your thoughts on this one? Well, that's the most important thing, isn't it? Um, items and property can be rebuilt and replaced, but you can't replace just even one single human life. So the fact nobody was died or was even injured is, is good news. Obviously agree with the insurance thing. Um, I just hope that uh, nothing has been lost that is irreplaceable or not possible to reconstruct. And if anybody is living anywhere vaguely near 
the this location then i would encourage you to to go and visit and give them some support and uh, if, if i didn't live in the wrong country martin and the wrong side of the world and the wrong con- wrong continent I, I would certainly be going over there and uh, offering them my support back to you yeah that's good that's a good one and let's be brutally honest about this and i'm going to own up as well we've all accidentally left things on that should have been switched off this may be this may be something that got left on by accident that caused the fire on other occasions sometimes things get left on and they're perfectly okay sometimes the fault develops over a long period and the device dies and you fix the fix the device by having it on for a long period but we all make mistakes if it was somebody who left something on that they shouldn't have done they're going to feel bad for the rest of their life. So, uh, yeah, uh, let, let's see what the uh, the outcome really was. Right, move to our next news story. Using radio waves to diagnose climate issues. Hmm, that sounded interesting to me. So uh, I thought, let's have a look at this. And I thought, Ed, do you want to go first on this one? Yeah, can do. Currently, to look at what's happening in the atmosphere, the ionosphere, etc., uh, light is used and spec. Oh, I can't pronounce this spectroscopy. Yeah, spectroscopy. And what has uh, actually been said now in the uh, Spectrum magazine from the IEEE is that we're going to have six G telephone networks all over the place, which are like at about hundred gigahertz and higher we can use those signals to get similar results. And, of course, there's going to be a lot more of them around. So basically they're saying they can work here as a side effect of the 6G network going in for the cell phones, uh, a side effect of it. They can use it to measure what's going on in the uh, atmosphere and uh, then you know, get a better idea of uh, climate. And I'm not sure whether this is actually more towards ionosphere, more towards weather. So the way the article's written, it's more towards better prediction of the weather, the terrestrial weather. Although uh, I would suspect it has some bearing on uh, radio weather as well. So, um, yeah, as always in the IEEE, these are things that are proposed as somewhere that can be or something can be investigated rather than this actually being a final commercial product yet but it's nice to see that people are thinking okay we're going to get the 6g network anyway what can we use it for in addition to uh, what it's actually meant to be used for and you know that's that's a good use of science in okay we're going to have that radiation there anyway Let's uh, see if we can't use it for some uh, useful purpose. Yeah, I'm all for uh, using science for whatever. And it's it's interesting that they're thinking outside the box with this one, which is the good one. Karen, what do you think uh, on this one? I mean, uh, predicting the weather better is going to be a good thing, isn't it? Oh, I think so. Um, I understood it to be more about uh, predicting uh, how the ionosphere is going to behave because it's proposed to look at the rate and the way the radio waves are absorbed and that those those uh, those observations would would help determine the property of of what's going on in the ionosphere (laughs) i have to laugh a little bit because I'm wondering if people <laughs> might more willingly accept 6G. All of these protests over the years of uh, 5G and then 6G and people saying how horrible it is. This is certainly good publicity for 6G. It's, it's almost as if they, <laughs> they hired a bunch of scientists uh, to do public relations for them uh, to make 6G a good thing. And, and frankly, I do think this, this adaptive use of 6G is fabulous. I, I think do, 
if you can get anything to do double duty or triple duty, go for it. So when it finally does happen and when we are using 6G, let's see how it goes. Uh, I, th I think the fact that the human mind is always pushing beyond the obvious is, uh, well, certainly a, an amateur radio thing and it's a science thing. So I have hopes for this. I, I like the story. And maybe we'll finally figure out why propagation is so bad on some days. For real. <laughs> Back to you, Martin. Yeah, I, I think uh, being an amateur, like what you said, it, it does give you an inquiring mind. And you, you, you look at these things, you go, yeah, that's interesting. Or what, what would happen if? And all those sort of things. And I, I like to see these new stories, come, this type of story come along because it does uh, it doesn't just give you the answer uh, it gives you the idea of what might be possible Dan what's your thoughts well I think that um, this is probably quite a ways away I mean I don't even know where, how, what's how, what the status of 6g is I mean how close we're really close to how close we are to having a 6g networks. But then uh, uh, I think a lot of study is going to be needed to figure out, you know, what absorption characteristics all these different gases have, and then uh, extrapolating that into actual measurements. Uh, so I think we're kind of a ways away. But one, one thing I, that sort of impresses me about this is, again, this sort of points out how useful amateur radio can be because what is this? This is an RF technology. So we're going to need people that know RF technology to, to, to make these measurements and figure out how to, how to make them and then, then um, uh, extrapolate from the data. So uh, to me, this is actually a, an amateur radio story in a way because we're going to need people to do all that stuff and, th and they're going to need RF experience and amateur radio gives them RF experience. It certainly does, and uh, in fairness, I think we are getting close to having a shortage of RF engineers. There aren't that many about. I mean, okay, I've uh, I worked for a company for thirteen months. I've now moved on, but you know, finding an RF engineer is going to be difficult. So uh, there aren't that many of us about. So uh, amateur radio certainly. For any youngsters, could actually be the start of a career for you. So uh, that's a good one. Edmunds, I mean, better weather forecasts. I mean, um, 100 gigs, I would have thought, would have put, pushed straight through the atmosphere, the ionosphere, straight out of the space if it's pointed up. But traveling um, close to the ground should have some effect, I would have thought. Well, it's an amazing use of technology, isn't it? And at frequencies like that, absorption from raindrops or even ice crystals um, in the air could be a very major thing. I, I, I don't have any experience of this, incidentally. 70 centimetres is the highest frequency band that I've ever used from home. Um, so I can't even describe myself as a microwaver. But it would never have occurred to me that that microwave frequencies potentially could be used for this kind of thing. But it, it just goes to show that wherever you think the frontier of technology is, it's not. Because 100 years ago, at the dawn of amateur radio, people would have told you that frequencies shorter than 200 metres or somewhere around there were useless and couldn't really be used for anything in particular and uh, now we're up into the microwave region aren't we and we'll probably find in decades ahead that where we think the frontier of technology is 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 up in the terahertz range um, so it's mind-blowing isn't it martin so other than being thoroughly impressed i can't think of anything sensible to say sorry <laughs> No problems, no problems. But it is it is an interesting technology, and yeah, let's see how this one goes. I'm sure we can monitor it over the next few years, and we'll be ahead of the game plan because us amateurs know it's coming, which is good. Right, move to our last news story, 
and hams track down medicine in short supply for a critically ill child. Now, that has got to be a great news story. I thank Karen for finding it for me because I didn't spot it. But most people will help. Um, And I think this is a great story, Karen. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Martin. Who knows how to use a network better than hams, right? (laughs) This was an amazing use of a network. This was a case of a little girl in a hospital with a very bad, very dangerous neurologic condition needing a particular antiviral drug, which she was being treated with in the hospital, and the hospital ran short on supply and could not find it. And the father of the little girl reached out to a ham um, in Bangladesh, where the hospital was, where the family is, where the girl was hospitalized, and he reached out to hams nearby in India. So this story actually not only crosses uh, geography, it really crosses borders. Um, So states throughout India, hams in each of the states throughout India went looking for it. In West Bengal, they thought they found the right drug, but it was similar, but a different different brand and they didn't want to take a risk with that so they kept looking and finally in um, New Delhi they found the exact drug uh, and one of the hams there uh, was instructed to somehow try to get it to Bangladesh and again all through the use of amateur radio and networking an individual at the airport who was heading home to Bangladesh agreed to transport it. Uh, now, I want to tell you, this This all happened within the space of 48 hours once it was determined there was a shortage. So everybody worked pretty quickly on this. The individual who spoke to the ham flew home with the drug, uh, was met at the airport in Bangladesh, and the drug was transported to the hospital and given to the little girl. Wow. <laughs> Express service, huh? That's amateur radio. Different kind of crisis management than than we're used to hearing about, but a crisis, a very personal crisis nonetheless, and uh, thankfully a happy ending. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, I'm I'm pleased it was a happy ending, and uh, as I said, uh, most people, if they hear the story, would have done something, but it, it does prove that there are good people in the human race, and uh, nicely... Most of the amateurs I've met are in that bucket, so uh, that's a good one. Edmund, what's your thoughts on this one? Well, yes, I think the overwhelming majority of people in the human race are good people who will help. It just tends to be the way that the world goes that, you know, if if 999 good things happen and one really bad things happen, then it'll be the one bad thing that you hear about over and over again on the news and in social media. But radio amateurs do seem to be, generally speaking, more that way inclined. I, I must admit, Martin, if I was in serious trouble and I had the choice between calling on a random radio amateur to help me or a random member of the public to help me, then without a moment's hesitation, I would always go to the radio amateur first. So this is a a very heartening news story, Martin. And other than to say, I'm very glad that it had a happy ending and it's good uh, news and good publicity, even possibly for amateur radio. Um, there's nothing I can add. Yeah, I think it's good news. Ed, what's your thoughts on this one? Yeah, just echoing what everybody else has said. It's just an example of volunteering. In the case in India, we, we hear a lot of these stories where the the network of amateur radio is used to organise the logistics and also to uh, also to coordinate uh, the volunteers, and in this case, it's not just in a region or a state, it's actually across borders as well. And we probably all know politically, India and uh, Bangladesh don't necessarily get on that well all the time. And, you know, that's 
totally irrelevant in this case because what was uh, what was at risk was the the life or the well being of the young child, and uh, everybody pulled the weight and did a good job. Um, it's just a shame that these kind of stories, although they get good publicity in India and Bangladesh, they never seem to get into world news. And I think that particular story deserves to be in world news. But, uh, of course, while there's wars and things going on everywhere else, uh, it's not uh, it's not covered. Back to you, Martin. Dan, have we left you anything to say on this one? Oh, sure. I always have something to say. <laughs> and what, what I would say is that this story still points out the, how to say usefulness, that's not quite the right word, but the usefulness of amateur radio in less developed parts of the world, okay? And, you know, I, and it's easy for me to say this, but I, I think that maybe those of us that are in the more developed parts of the world should be doing more to promote amateur radio in those parts. And, you know, here's a case where, you know, maybe this was the, the fellow's only opportunity to reach out to, to try and find that drug. You know, here in the US, US there's probably clearing houses for these things and a, a much bigger supply. So finding the right drug and getting it somewhere, you know, it, it's, it's, it's easy. But, you know, in places like Bangladesh, Africa, maybe even some parts of South America, you know, this is not so easy. And amateur radio would have a would be able to play a role. So, uh, like I say, it, it, maybe maybe those of us in uh, in the more developed parts of the world should be thinking about that and in promoting it more in these places. I mean, that would be good for amateur radio and good for those people. Yeah, it certainly would, Dan. Certainly would. And I think uh, you know you, you summed it up well. So, all in all, a really good news story, Karen. You found, and I'm glad that the young lady got the uh, medication she needed um, just goes to show what you can do when people work together right let's find out what the guys have been up to since the last time we had a chat Karen would you like to go first sure thanks Martin uh, I do hate to sound like a broken record but yes you are going to hear about POTA again <laughs> I've been out quite a bit more, even in the winter, wintry weather, I should say. Uh, cold weather will not keep me from my parks. So lots of blankets and just lots of, lots of plans. I bought uh, a couple of more ham sticks, which I mount on the rooftop of the car. And I'm gonna be going to more parks different parks, um, trying different bands, trying to, to keep things interesting through the winter. I even purchased, and I swore I would never do this for POTA because I like to travel light. I don't even take a computer with me. I want to keep my POTAs very portable. And I swore that with a resonant hamstick on the roof of my car that I would never, ever, ever use a tuner because I didn't need a tuner. Well, I had an experience where my resonant uh, 15 meter ham stick was not behaving all that well in bad weather a couple of days ago. So I decided to spring for a, an antenna tuner, a little one, very small one that, that will accommodate up to a hundred Watts. And we'll see how that goes. It's, it's an off brand. I'll probably only use it intermittently, but I have been humbled. I, I now realize that sometimes you do need an antenna tuner. So um, I'm eating my words on on that. Big news is getting ready for 12 Days of Christmas special event. Be operating again this year. Looking forward to that. Everybody, please come work us. Uh, we will be on the air. Um, I don't have the exact dates in front of me, but very excited about that. And of course, looking beyond that, the, the K3Y a uh, special event in January for um, Straight Key Century Club. We love, love special events. And that's really it uh, for me, but that should, that should keep me out of trouble for the next couple of weeks. I'll send it back to you, Martin. Let's hear what the other guys are up to. Yeah, that's great. It sounds like you've been having fun. I never apologize for going out operating, Karen. <laughs> 
I wish I could get out as much as you do. Um, been a little bit busy the last few weeks. Oh, I just don't know where the time goes. But, hey, uh, I have a few radio things to tell you anyway in a minute. Dan, what have you been up to since we last spoke? Well, I'm actually more of a fair weather uh, POTA operator than Kieran is. It's been two weeks since I've been able to get out to a park. But um, one thing I've done, been doing actually just the last couple of days is um, I, I was going through some old uh, QST issues. When I say old, they're, you know, they're still 2023 issues. And I ran across an article on a project that uses a Raspberry Pi Pico as a keyer. And um, so I, uh, I uh, have a Pico. I bought one back when they came out just for kicks. And I said, oh, this looks like a nice little project. I'll, I'll play around with this. Well, I, I had been using an old laptop with Linux on it for programming these kind of things. And uh, I loaded up the uh, in a integrated development environment. It's a thing called Thani, T-H-O-N-N-Y. And I, I, it, it was an old version already since I hadn't used it for a while. And I couldn't seem to update it for some reason. And I'm still not sure exactly why. But I decided I'm going to put a, one of the new ham radio distributions on the on the laptop. Well, that got to be more of a project than I wanted. I, I still hadn't managed to uh, to do this for, for like three days. I just I, I tried four times to put this one distribution on the laptop, and I just had, had no success with it. So I, I went to Plan B and uh, tried to tried another distribution from another uh, guy, and that went fine. I saw now I'm all finally all set. So so now I got to actually get to the to the actual project. Um, another thing I want to announce is that um, I actually got a grant from ARDC. My grant proposal was approved, and what I'm going to use this grant for in 2024 is I'm going to teach ham radio classes at different events that should have that we think should have more ham radio presence so the last couple of years i've taught a, a ham radio class at a, a hacker conference called defcon and ardc basically pay, paid it because i was uh, a, an employee then well, well now i'm going to get to do this uh, not only at defcon but three others uh, throughout the country and uh, i'm looking forward to that i think this is going to be a lot of fun and uh, I'm, call I'm calling myself the ham radio evangelist. So I'll be going out and uh, making uh, ham radio operators out of people who should have ham radio licenses. Well, that's good news, and Dan, and it's good news, and I'm sure you'll enjoy that one. And so, yeah, uh, that sounds a real good one. Ed, what have you been up to over in Germany? I suppose it's now inside work from now on. Now you've got snow. No, well, first of all, last four to five weeks I've been ill, so I haven't been able to uh, get out as I usually try to to uh, to do outside activations. But I'm glad that's behind me now. But uh, yeah, I'd like to catch up on some of these activations that I wanted to do. But we're expecting heavy snowstorms over the next two days to add to the snow that we already have. So I'm probably going to have to wait a little while, and I think. Uh, in December, I want to uh, chase, I try to chase some of the uh, the UK bunkers on the air because they've got a special advent calendar award for uh, working people that are activating bunkers uh, every day from uh, the first through to the uh, to the twenty fourth of December. So uh, I'll be doing a bit of chasing, hunting, whatever they wish to call it, from the home station for that. And looking a bit further ahead, uh, I need to get a good portable 10-meter antenna ready for January the 1st because from the January the 1st for 12 months, uh, summits on the air have the 2024 challenge, which is a 10-meter challenge this time around. So we're hoping that uh, we're going to see some very interesting uh, contacts on uh, 10 meters around the world. Um, I'll be running uh, sideband, but others will be running... Uh, CW or digital and should be an interesting year because it runs all the way through the year to see how the band varies because uh, you know with sporadic E and with the, the high uh, solar counts you know the top of the solar uh, cycle um, it should be a, a real buzz of a year for 10 meters in 2024 
Back to you, Martin. Yeah, yeah, it sounds uh, certainly sounds good, and it sounds like you're going to be very active next year as well. So uh, that's a good one. Edmund, what have you been up to since we last spoke? Well, I haven't done any amateur radio at all for the last two weeks because, sadly, on Monday, the 20th of November, my beloved 16-year-old cat, Tigger, had to be put to sleep. Um, So, for reasons I'm sure you can imagine, I've not really felt like doing any radio at all since then. But hopefully that will change in the days or weeks ahead, although there's not really anything much coming up it's the wrong time of year really for special event stations and that kind of thing um december is yota month youth on the air i think is that right um so i'll be listening out for them and there will also probably be quite a few stations on the air with the call sign golf bravo and then a number and then uh, hotel november yankee happy new year at the end so might be worth listening out for for some of those particularly in the second half of december in the run-up to christmas and the new year but the main thing of note that i did before tigger passed away oh and incidentally um the 24 hours before she did sunday the 19th was the Cats Bazaar, the Causton Amateur Transmitting Society radio rally. And I had intended to be there, and I would have been uh, in different circumstances. So if anybody went to that and was disappointed not to see me, I do apologise for not being there. I had fully intended to be there. But uh, hopefully November 2024, I'll be able to make an appearance. But uh, The week prior to that was the Essex CW Club Activity Week and I wanted to take part as a gesture of support towards that club and it's not a contest so all bands are okay including the walk bands but because I'm boring and predictable I stuck to 40 metres the whole week and uh, I worked, I had 26 QSOs with 24 separate stations, uh, mostly around 12 words per minute, but for one of them, which was a, a rubber stamp contact with a special event station, I did go up well over 20 words a minute. And I would encourage people to have a go on cw that there there were three things that i found really heartening um number one was that whenever i called cq everybody without exception came back to me at whatever speed i was sending at um the vast majority of qso's happened when i called cq rather than going back to somebody else who was calling and i had thought before I started this, that if I called, say, 12 words per minute, I might have people coming back to me at 18 words per minute or 25 words or whatever. But to everybody's credit, whatever speed I called CQ at, they came back to me at the same speed, which was a pleasant surprise. The second thing which encouraged me a little bit was that I had some QSOs with people who came across as being very experienced CW operators, but even they occasionally made mistakes and had to go back and resend the word. And the fact that people who on the face of it have had decades of practice and who came across as being really good and really experienced, the fact that they occasionally made mistakes, that made me feel slightly better on the the regular occasions when I made mistakes. And the third thing that was really good was that there was no tuning up, jamming, whistling, deliberate QRM at all that I was aware of. Sadly, in the last couple of years in particular, I have been aware of more instances of hearing people deliberately, well, deliberately causing QRM or whistling or you know, making funny noises or whatever on top of SSB stations 
I didn't hear any of that on CW, so that was really nice as well. So I'm glad I took part. I won't say it was fun all the way through, particularly at the beginning, but sometimes things don't have to be fun to be worthwhile. So I'm going to stick with it. My CW isn't great now. If if Dan listened to me, he'd probably sit there holding his head in his hands, I would think. But no, however, no, no, bad, no. however bad it is now, I can say with absolute certainty that it's considerably better than it was at the beginning of the Essex CW Activity Week. So I will stick with it, and I will try to absolutely master it in 2024, eventually. Excellent. Back Excellent. to you, Martin. Excellent. Oh, that's a, that's a good one, Edwin. I'm pleased to, you enjoyed yourself. Now, what have I been up to? Well, I had Colin over for about a week. Colin came over just before the Cats Bazaar, and we were extremely busy, <laughs> so much so that I didn't make one of the club evenings on a Monday night, and I didn't make the committee meeting on the Tuesday basically because I got home and fell asleep. But we were out doing all sorts of bits and pieces. Colin came over for the Cats Bazaar, and as well as uh, going and watching his football team, uh, we we had a great time at the Cats Bazaar. You were missed, Edmund, not only by the ICQ guys, but there were a couple of people that was were asking where you were. So uh, you were missed, and... As I say, be good to see you um, there next year. And pl- I'm, I am planning to be down to see my other son Lee at some point in time in your area. So I'm going to try and hook up with you as well if we can, if we can do it. Right, Cats Bazaar, great um, little rally. As I say, we got chatting to lots of people, and one thing another. I bought another radio. I needed it like a hole in the head, really, but I couldn't resist it. I sold my Belfang UV5R back in the summer at a rally, and I bought an equivalent at, at this rally. And, I, and uh, I'll tell you more about it uh, as the time goes on. It's a, a very, very interesting radio, and I might even do a feature on it. Not because of... Uh, it's a cheap Chinese handy, but all the things you can do with it. And one of the people I spoke to was um, a gentleman called Ian Keezer, uh, G3ROO. And with a bit of luck, and if Colin gets uh, the interview edited in time, we'll be using that as the feature. Ian is an absolutely wonderful guy to talk to. Not just because I was wearing an orange shirt. He gives everybody the time of day. He's a, just a, one of life's gentlemen. Ian, uh, quite big in the GQRP club. He's also uh, originally set up the original Kanga electronics uh, for making kits back in the early days. But a, just a real nice guy. And I took... We we spent a day, we went down to his house, Colin and I went down to his house and we recorded an interview with him. So hopefully it'll be in this episode. And last but not least, uh, Monday night, I was playing, trying to help one of the amateurs there who uh, also has uh, connections to a shooting range. And we were fixing one of their um, targets their revolving targets. So uh, that was a bit interesting as well. So uh, all in all, not a lot of radio. I have been playing far too much with this uh, little handy talkie. I'll tell you what it is. It's a Quansheng UVR5, UV-R5. Mine's a brackets uh, eight, uh, closed brackets. Uh, And I think the only difference is it's got a slightly different cabinet and uh, uh, the display on this one instead of white is uh, amber. But an interesting radio that I may talk about more as time goes on. So that's what I've been up to. So all's left for me to do now is to thank the guys for turning up, and we'll continue with the rest of the uh, podcast.
I'd like to thank Mr. Dan Romacek, KB6NU. Well, my pleasure as always, Martin. Yeah, no problem, Stan. Great to have you. I'd like to thank Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT. It's been great as always, Martin. Yeah, yeah, and you'll forgive me for, for, for only being on FM, I'm sure, not doing CW, Karen. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Edmund Spicer, M0MG. You can do tone modulated CW on FM, Martin, 73. 73, <laughs> yeah. And last but not least, Mr. Ed Durant, DD5LP. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Th- thanks, everybody. And uh, to all the listeners, please be careful on the roads and the uh, festive season with the icy roads and uh, stay safe and enjoy the holiday. Uh, enjoy the hobby. Yeah, I agree with you 100%, Ed. Okay, well, I'm now going to say 73 is sure, and we'll continue with the rest of the podcast. 73, guys. 73. 73. 73. Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now. For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. And now it's time to have a look at the news in brief from me, Colin M6BOY. We start off with news here that NASA has launched a new app to make it easier than ever to spot the International Space Station at uh, night. Uh, so they've been operating a spot the station website, uh, but this new app available for both iPhone and Android phones brings augmented reality features and a handy interface to learn more about the orbiting uh, laboratory above our heads. So you, we can find this in both app stores. We'll put a link to this on the ICQ podcast webpage for you. And uh, no, that also sends a notification each time the station passes over your location, both day and night. So uh, a great way of uh, spotting the International Space Station. Yota starts uh, this month, and the call sign GB23 Yota is active for the duration of the month. It's uh, going to start off uh, with the Cray Valley Radio Society on the day of our release, transfer to the Wick High School, uh, which will be using it, and then moving on to Sandringham School, and then the Malik High School as well throughout the week. At the end of uh, this week, on Saturday 9th of uh, December, the RSGB National Radio Centre will be operating as uh, GB3 Toyota as on that uh, day. Uh, so lots of QSOs with young uh, radio amateurs on the air. Please uh, get involved and uh, show your support for this event. And uh, as I say, hopefully we can uh, generate lots of lovely interest in our hobby uh, to these uh, young enthusiasts. We finish off with news that the second preview build of SDR Connect is available for download and contains a number of new features, including direct frequency input, additional bands with IARU regional support, IQ recording, IQ playback, uh, amongst other things. So uh, again, link to this on the ICQ podcast uh, webpage for you, that if you're uh, looking for the SDR Connect uh, preview, I say preview number two has been released. Right, now we head over to our features episode where we'll be talking about spy radios and parasets. As always, hope you enjoy. And now what you've all been waiting for, this episode's feature from the ICQ podcast. Well, hi guys. For this episode's podcast feature, I've managed to get to come and talk to somebody that he always gives me his time at rallies whenever I see him. And it turns out we've probably got a hell of a lot in common, although you are more senior than me. And uh, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Ian Keezer, G3ROO. Hi, Ian. Hello there. Nice to meet you. Yeah, well, as I say, you always give me plenty of time at the rallies, even if I haven't got an orange yeah. jacket on. So... I've come down to see you. We're sitting in one of your workshops and, you know, you've done a lot in the hobby. I know that uh, in, you showed me uh, what you used to do with Kanga products, which uh, was, which is interesting. Oh yes. Well, that was all, all because back in, oh, I should have looked up the year actually, but it was about 82. I used to write a lot of articles for the shortwave magazine. And um, the editor once put half-page advert in, and it said, Kangaroo Electronics, stand by for their next project. And uh, that 
was a VFO for five megs, and it was very, very stable. And it just so happened that I got enough to make about 150 kits. So I made them all up and uh, sold them, and that was the start of Kanga Products. Right. So that, I mean, that that is, you were almost forced into Kanga Products by the editor then. By the, yeah, yes, it was. And uh, I was, I had a lovely job because I could do a lot of my work at work. <laughs> and, um, it, and then in 1984, a couple of years after the uh, the on the the birth of Kanga Pro, Kanga Electronics, then I was taken ill and had to leave work. And funny part of my life, I lost my balance basically and I couldn't walk. I had to learn to walk again, and um, I couldn't do all the work. It was it had taken off. I was making lots of different kits. And I took on, uh, as a partner, my ex-diving buddy. And uh, so that's when we changed the name to Kanga Products. But um, it wasn't the birth of the company. The birth of the company was two or three years prior to that. But uh, still going strong. You've you've been involved with lots of things. I mean, you just mentioned... and. I wouldn't have known. You did driving. Oh uh, yes, uh, instructor there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a lovely sport, and um, could earn a bit of money as well. Working in the in the dock, uh, on the taking wires off props uh, on the ferries and various underwater jobs you had to do, and uh, it was it was good money. So I was rebuilding the house at the time. Or still rebuilding it, uh, and uh, so every penny was needed. Yeah, yeah. So and then there's one other thing we we mentioned before we get into electronics, because I mean, <laughs> you know, it's nice that people understand sort of some of the things we come from. Uh, both you and I flew gliders, but you were much better at it than me. Well, no, I only just stuck with it a bit longer than you. <laughs> it's always difficult. I mean, the first two years of uh, gliding life is. Uh, uh, you tend to be a dog's body. You only get to fly when when there's an instructor available. Um, but no, I stuck with it. And uh, the airfield is only a mile away that I uh, did all my training at. And yes, wonderful hobby, wonderful hobby. I loved it. Second to radio, but um, but uh, definitely a good experience. Yeah, yeah. So in fairness, I mean. Lovely, lo- lovely. Your airfield's only about a mile away. I mean, I was travelling forty odd miles to yes. get to the one I was. Well, flying. I was doing that for Kenley, of course, when I was up at Kenley twice a week, All right. duty instructor. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you lived up in the sort of same part of the world I live, or fairly, fairly close uh, when you were growing up, and it was interesting. You talked about uh, going up to um, Lyle Street and Tottenham Court Road and all those places in Edgware Road. Uh, with yes. All the electronics. Right from a young lad, uh, I I heard Morse when I was eight on the ho- home radio. They were the beacons down the bottom end of the long wave, and so I sat there decoding them from a, a copy of the Morse code that Dad found for me, and uh, decoded those and and learnt Morse. I I could read Morse uh, eight ten words a minute at that time. Uh, there were quite a lot of slow morse activity on the bands at then. The higher speeds that we have now are due to electronic keys, but the back then they were straight keys, and 8, 10, 12 words a minute were very, very common. So that that's, I was soon progressed up when I... I suppose, really, I was... I had my first CW contact when I was 13. Pirate, of course. Uh, oh, as if, come on. <laughs> Uh, built a transmitter and had to have a QSO, but then there you are. That's all part of part of growing oh, yeah. up with the, with the hobby. Yeah, yeah. yeah so say great, great fun. And and the thing is, what what impresses me is that you you are passionate about radio, and you know I've I've seen you at lots of rallies, and we've been lucky today to come down and see you at your home location. You've got an ideal location. We're not going to say where it is totally, but you've got a nice, a nice lo- quiet location. location. 
really relatively quiet. quiet. Yeah, I mean, I drove down this road and I wasn't even sure if it was a road. <laughs> <laughs> That's Kent for you. That's Kent. We're a mass of small lanes. Yeah. Well, I was actually born in Kent, so uh, <laughs> whereabouts? I was born in folks in hospital. Oh right. Yeah. Oh, just down the road. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah we moved away when I was about thirteen. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I lived in the area for quite a while. So, good age. Good age, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, one of the things we've come to see you about today is you have an interest in uh, parachuting uh, these parasets and things like yeah, that, the don't paraset, you? Yeah, the parasets, yes. Yeah. Or generally spy radios, B2 parasets, a lot of, uh, lot of uh, Polish tra- spy transceivers. And uh, also military. Uh, I'm downsizing my military uh, uh, collection because it's just so heavy. And I can't, I can't pick it up. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, around you, uh, well, you can't really see on the camera, can you? But, oh, you, they can see behind. Uh, there's a good mix. There's a good mix. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I can tell you, you were uh, into the military. I saw what you had at the rally, the last rally we were both yeah. at. There was a lot of military stuff on the table, so I thought, yeah, Ian's... Uh, there was even more, you know, sold most of it in the car park waiting to get in. <laughs> oh, you're going to upset the organisers <laughs> now, aren't you? <laughs> well, they should have been there earlier. <laughs> we but, were. Um, but it just goes to show, you know, if you're at a rally early... <laughs> That uh, the rally starts. starts. The rally starts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why wouldn't you yeah. sell it out of the back of your car yeah. if you're there? But uh, now going back to the uh, spy sets, you know, you've shown me some interesting spy sets today. Uh, an original uh, Paraset and then a um, B2. A B2. But you've also shown me a rep- rep- replica of a uh, Paraset that you've. Uh, people have got round to producing just for the fun of it. Oh yes, and trying to get it as accurate as possible. Of course, you'll never, never fox them completely. But the idea is to think people just sort of think, oh, he's got a paraset. No, we haven't, but we, we we like to think we have. But they all work, and well, <laughs> keeping them working is a bit of a bit of a thing. But uh, all the sets in here have been working. If they're not working now, but Luckily, you can once you've uh, had them open and you've found the fault. You, usually, that fault has reoccurred, so you know what it is anyway before you even open the set up. Well, you've got a good idea. They're very simple as well. They're very simple designs. One valve transmitter. You know, yeah. I mean, it's very simple. Yeah, but it was simple for a reason. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, reliability. Yeah, it had to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. And easy repaired in the field. I mean, the Paraset is a damn good example. I mean, you've got two valves, which are metal case, so they're rugged. Um, everything in there is point-to-point wiring, supported on the component or the pins of the valve bases and things like that. There's no tag strips as such. Uh, so, yes, it's a, a very rugged design that's easily repaired. Yeah. Well, it would have to be easily repaired in the field with minimal equipment, yes. I assume. Otherwise, you've got to wait and you've got to a get a message back to England to say send me another one, yeah. uh, or you they do repairs and I think there are a lot more repairs done than it was first imagined. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, electronics does survive. I mean, you were saying today the the if you're going to repair one or some of the older more valve equipment, you know. Changing the capacitors is a must, isn't it? They go leaky. Uh, yeah, and and it happens in modern sets. Capacitors, you know, the little little electrolytics in there, they dry out very easily. Of course, there's extra heat in the valve sets, which means that they dry out quicker. But um, pretty good. I mean, I just did an AR88. Uh, well, did just did. It was over a year ago. Um, and I only had to change about half of the capacitors. When you actually measure them, they were fine. So that's not really bad for a 70-year-old piece of kit. Oh. Hang on, 70 years, so I'm near so, 80. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. they, 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 made them, they made them to last in them days. Well, they, they were all, all sensible components. I mean, capacitor with rolled-up paper with an aluminium foil. Yeah. Nothing really to go wrong in them. 
when you've got electrolytes that you know it's leaking out of cans then of course you have got a, a, a potential leakage and, and a failure of components yeah yeah so it's 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 an interesting hobby now i i'm gonna jump around a little bit we when we first arrived we were chatting to you and we were in your shack and uh, i mentioned vhf and you went yeah i've just got back into this <laughs> but it's nice to know that you do do a lot of things and uh, you mentioned oh you- there's there's I mean, there's so much fun to be had out there on sideband and CW on two meters. And everyone sits on channels chatting to their mates. Well, that's fine. Don't mind that. But what really gets me is that they, they've they deserted the other modes down the bottom of the band where there's a lot, lot of fun to be had. Oh, hell yeah. of a lot of fun. Um I mean, sideband, sideband on two. Uh, well, I, I've two days in succession, flat two meter band, talking to a friend down in Chepstow. Um, that's what, 200 miles from here, 200 yeah. something miles. He was running two watts. Well, it, that just goes to show that it can be done. Yeah, two and watts, five element Yagi he used. Yeah. Now I get I often get told I often get told there's no activity on two meters, nobody's using it, but the pieces. Now I live in South London. I would guarantee if you and I both lived in South London and I called you on the calling frequency and we forgot and let's be honest, forgot to move off the calling frequency, we'd have about two overs and the world and his wife will be screaming at us <laughs> to get off the frequency. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, well, well, that's it. That's why we have it to call it a calling frequency, isn't it? I mean, well, we should move out of politeness. We should. Yeah. But, but what I'm uh, suggesting is there are loads of people listening, and, but, oh, no but, they won't, but they won't operate. Oh, this happens on HF all the time, especially with the higher bands. The other day, uh, two of us here, Nigel, uh, M0NDE and myself, and we just went up to see what 10 was doing, and there was no, no activity on 10 except for some FT8. So there was obviously, band was lively, or yeah. there, potentially yeah. lively. I put out a CQ on the key and had a reply come back immediately. When we finished that contact, there were four signals visible on the band scope, on the key there you go. because if you don't it's point is just listening on the band because everyone else is just listening but you start to make some noise other people see and say oh the band is active and come on so for goodness sake when you get on a band if it's dead always call cq to make some activity and you'll be surprised what comes back yeah and if you're the one calling cq you could be the one with a mega pileup Yes, that's right. Yes, it yeah. could happen. Yeah. I mean, especially W was open, uh, it was wide open, what, Thursday, I think it was, morning, and uh, about 11 o'clock. And I had eight or ten QSOs, just just rubber stamps, but, you know, it was fun. You know, nice to have ten open. Yeah. And that's a wonderful band. Yeah. I was, uh, so I haven't done a much on, on ten myself. Have done it. Worth trying. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm more of a VHF yeah. band. I'll be honest with you. But it's VHF. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> is. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. But you were saying your favourite mode of operation. Your favourite band and your favourite mode of operation. And I've only ever had one contact on that band, and and the guy was like five miles up the road. Yeah, so. one sixty meters. Yeah. Oh no, 160. It's it's you've got, you've got to have real estate. I'm very fortunate. Got this place dirt cheap when uh, in the 1970 72. Uh, it was a derelict. Uh, we rebuilt it. My wife and I and my dad. Yeah. Uh, and uh, got a lovely house with two acres of land uh, and only two houses, three houses now uh, in close close proximity and good neighbours so I can put up my towers and I've got I've got two 80 foot towers and uh, two or you know, 30 and a 40 uh, now I'll take them one down don't need it 
and a wire antennas now i've taken all the beams i've realized the work involved in having using beams every year you've got to rebuild your beams you've got to read to service all your rotators and i have great fun with wire antennas so why bother why yeah you should say why um as i say i'm done a lot more more qrp operating on hf when i do operate Mm. and i used to say to people i get more fun going out doing three contacts on a sunday afternoon on qrp than 30 qro yeah and this is this is me throwing a hand grenade in the room people say to me qrp is like um what there's no time for qrp Uh, no time for qrp And I look them straight in the face, I say, QRO is like fishing for, for in a pond with dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> you throw the, the dynamite in, you yeah. kill all the fish and you get them. There's no skill. I think if, if people's actually sat down and thought about it, um, we've got to go from 10 watts to 100 watts is only two S points. Mm. If you look at it like that. So how many times have you said, oh, you're 5 and 9 plus 30? You know, well, it's okay. So he wound his power down by a factor of 10, and it'd be 5 and 9 plus 20. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Well, I, I mentioned once to a guy who was running a big contest station, I said, you guys never bother to talk to me when I'm a QRP. I usually leave it till the back end of the contest before I call and give some points away. And he said, Martin, we hear you. He said, but when we got somebody running a kilowatt in a foreign country or somebody running legal power in the UK for 400 watts, he said, they're so loud, we've got to get rid of them. Because yeah. we, so we work them first to get rid of them. But the trouble is, the next one comes along. And by the time we get round to we would work you, you got fed up and moved off somewhere else. Yeah. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah, it's a big problem. I think getting back to two metres. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not, I've, I've had a demonstration of FT8, for instance, but, or any of these, uh, modes, but it would definitely down here, we've perhaps got 20 or 30, uh, VHF amateurs on within 30 miles. Yeah. And we've got 10 modes. So there's two people per, per mode. So yeah. you're always talking to the same person if you're on. It's even on the repeater now. The repeaters, there's about six of us that are in regular use of the repeater. People are listening. Mm-hmm. We know they're listening because they come up with comments down club. Yeah. But, you know, they won't call in. Well, that's, that, that's, that's the real shame of our hobby at the moment is that it's not as active as as or it doesn't appear to be let's use the word appear doesn't appear to be as active as it actually is and if if people were to call then i think you'd have some great time i mean there was a um a period about six weeks ago there was a a thing on 145 alive mainly fm on uh, two meters but there were other bits of two meters going on i came on yeah you were on (coughs) and there were lots of contacts. Mm. I went out the day after, oh, sorry, the week after, and I worked somebody 40 miles away, running two and a half watts. He was on a handheld, uh, coming back to me. And, All right, I had my little log periodic on a pole with about, about 10 foot, and I ran two and a half watts. He was over the moon because I'd worked him. And so there are people out there, and this is we come back to. If you don't call... You they don't know you're there. No one knows you're there. That's right. That's right, yeah. Martin. Yeah. So, great. It's great to come down and see you. It was great to look at your your power sets and your spy sets. Really enjoyed that. It's always great to see you at the show. What's your plans going forward? What are you up to now? Because as much as I don't, I've not been around you long. I know you're a very busy person. You ain't going to stop. No, I don't don't want to. <laughs> but no. I, I'm I'm pushing eighty now, and uh, life is slowing down. I definitely, I can't do what I did last year, even. Um, but no, I've, I've on my interests have changed a bit this year. Top band has not hold held the fascination, but 
I've got 285 contracts, not confirmed, because I don't, I don't want that. I, I, I've, I've worked the station. I know I've worked the station, so that's all I need. Yeah. But I, 285 uh, countries on top band, and now to find a new country is just about impossible. And so my interest is sort of waning a bit there. It's going back towards uh, uh, CW on um, QRP. Uh, been on QRP quite a bit. Down here, um, having got rid of a lot of the big stuff, I've now got a bit more room that I can actually operate. Yes, I would like to get on some of the military gear. I've all, already got uh, my standard set for QRP and um, and spy operating, basically, is the 48-stroke one. Very rare trans transmitter, that. Right. It looks like the, B2, uh, the B2 transmitter, because it is. But they modified it for the Jedburgh group, and they put a Morse key on the front panel and uh, a protection over the meter. And, uh, oh, and it was a... Uh, it was run by a wind wound up generator. You see that square box yeah, there, yeah. Uh, windy handle. So one person could crank the handle, the other person operate the set. And I'd like to get that. I've tried to find the tripod for that. It was quite a simple tripod, but I'd like to find the tripod and uh, actually go on on the air using a wind up. I'm, I'm sure I can find someone to wind the handle. <laughs> um, I'm sure you would. I'm sure you would. And I, let's put this one out, out because I know the VMARS boys listen to us as well. Um, you know, if anybody's got a tripod or if you've got the, if they, you had the plans for it, you could get one manufactured. Oh yes. You? Yes. Oh, it's, it's, it's simple tripod. Very simple by the look of the picture. So yes, if there's anyone out there, I'm Ian's interested. <laughs> there, there you go. And I assume that, uh, apart from operating, you're still going to have the soldering on, on, aren't you? Yeah, unfortunately, I've lost sight in my right eye. Oh. So now soldering is very difficult. I don't touch printed circuit boards. Uh, I can stab around and uh, make a, a reasonable joint. And I've got a friend that if I do have to do sort of some real fine work, he comes around and uh, does the fine work for me. Yeah. And that's a hell of a disappointment, using, losing the eye. Yeah. Well, you carry it well, because I wouldn't have known. I've, I've been with you for about an hour or more now, and I wouldn't have known that you had lost sight of one of your yeah. eyes. It's not totally gone, but it's it's um, fragmented. Yeah. You go, I mean, I can't even read the top line of the uh, of the uh, optician's thing. You know, it's, it's that bad. Oh, dear. But it's, it's better to have something than a shadowy thing than yeah. nothing at all. Yeah. So, I mean, at the start of our conversation, before we, we started recording, uh, we talked about work, and I was talking about working for Philips in the television factory, and you worked uh, on the same, not at the same place, but... Only a half a mile well, away. Only half a mile away. But I was saying um, that they had fault finders, and I was a repair guy, and they said to me, mine changed that capacitor, and I changed that capacitor, or mine remove that wire that sort of thing so you're now in the fault finder stage and i'd have to be all yeah, over you right. get yeah, it's a big circle a big circle <laughs> we got full circle so uh, yeah it's always positive listen i um i thoroughly enjoyed chatting to you i, I know that uh, our listeners will thoroughly enjoy this if somebody wanted to get in touch with you email or qthr on qrz.com that's what yes. I thought you'd say. Yeah, yeah they've got that. Check, check in out on um, QRZ. Uh, Ian's course on his G3ROO. And uh, guys, and I'm going to stitch you up here, Ian. If you're at a rally, for God's sake, go and talk to Ian. He's a <laughs> lovely guy. And you've always given me your, your time. Even oh, if I haven't had an orange I, shirt on, I, you've I, try to, I try to make get interest. We did a lot of Morse training the last few years. Mm. Uh, we're just thinking about starting again now. Uh, no, we've got to we've got to put something back into the hobby. If you're going to enjoy your hobby, it's worth putting something back into it, and uh, it's that in itself is very rewarding. Yeah, and I've just as we're closing out, I've just realised there's one other thing you and I are going common. 
We're both members of GQ or P Club. Oh, right, yes, yes. Well, I, I'm 395, so that's how long I've been in it. Yeah, yeah. Mine's in the 2000s. Yeah. I, from what I remember, I can't remember the exact number. I think it's a two and there's a four and a five in there somewhere. Uh, that was, that was, when I first joined with George Dobbs, George and I hit it off. Um, we used to go over to America at all the rallies over there. Had wonderful time with poor old George. Yeah. Uh, he's left us now, yeah. and... Uh, yeah. No, don't be joining him soon. <laughs> no, 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 don't say that. I met George once um, when we were starting the podcast. Mm. I met him once at uh, one of the conventions and had a quick chat with him on the floor, and he was a nice guy. Really, lovely chat. Ra- lovely really chat. Lovely chat. Okay. I'd like to thank you very much, Ian, for inviting us down. Well, thanks for coming, Martin. Hey, it's, it's been, been a, a real pleasure. meeting you, and uh, yeah. yeah, it's been great. And it's given us something else to chat about where it rallies, isn't it? Yeah, that's I'll right. Say, no, yeah, no, what are you no, up to? Yeah. <laughs> so, listen, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm sure our listeners are going to get a lot from this interview. Oh, well, I hope but, it's interesting. Of course, it's always interesting. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Martin. The ICQ Amateur Ham Radio Podcast, serving the amateur ham radio community fortnightly since 2008. Well, everybody, I really hope you've enjoyed our feature and our conversation with Ian, uh, G3R Oscar Oscar, or Romeo Oscar Oscar, I should say, to do it correctly. Uh, was such a, an engaging, interesting gentleman who uh, was very hospitable to us and gave us lots of his time. And uh, then I think, uh, I say, you know, certainly somebody that, uh, I say, if you've got any interesting military or spy radio or anything on those lines, it's, he's certainly a guy to uh, to catch while you can, really, isn't he? He certainly is, Colin, and I'll be honest with you, if I live closer, I'd probably want to uh, spend more, much, much more time with Ian than we actually did. Um, such a wealth of knowledge, such a gentleman in fairness, and uh, very, very interesting to talk to. And outside of radio, him and I have done very, very similar things along the line of life, So, but... Uh, you know, he's he's such a such a gentleman who gives you all the time in the world and it's not just because we were wearing an orange shirt. Um I've met Ian many times and uh, we should have done this interview before, but hopefully you guys will thoroughly enjoy uh, our chat with him. Yeah, I think I think what I found as well, um, more than anything else about him is is um how active he is, how he's not allowed anything to slow himself down and, and is still very passionate about experimenting, about learning, about creating, about uh, you know, really still keeping himself active and, and really involved in the hobby and you know, not just sitting back as well and saying, well, I've always done it this way and this is where I'm always going to do it. He, he seems to really uh, want to uh, continue to uh, to push on, doesn't he? Yeah, it certainly does. Uh, certainly does. And that, that's the, I think that's the big important thing about hobby is, you know, and we, we, we mentioned this within the news round table that hams seem to have an ethos of helping each other and being active and using our brains. And Ian is certainly falls into that. That category is very active, um, st- still bright as a button. Far cleverer than ever I am, in fairness, uh, but uh, just generally nice gentleman to talk to. Yeah, good echo that one there. So we've also got a video interview as well of Ian, which we'll publish as well and pop that on the YouTube channel, so you can check that out as well. And uh, as I say, as always, uh, as I say, you know, hope you enjoy that interview. And uh, as I say, it might uh, it sparks some interest in some things from there. Well, as always, uh, we'd like to thank our monthly subscription donors that, as I say, help us pay our way and keep uh, your ICQ podcast show advert free. Uh, as I say, just one more episode uh, left before Christmas to show your support for the work we've done this year, and we'd encourage you to go to icqpodcast.com forward slash donate to, as I say, take in part in uh, either a one-off donation or one of our many options for uh, continued support to help us out along our way and, as I say, paying our, uh, our, our bills, etc. So we really do hope you will help us out from there. Uh, so as they check those uh, pages out uh, we'd also like to thank our colleagues who took part in the news round table that's Dan KB6 November Uniform Karen KD2 Golf Uniform Tango 
Edmund, Mike Zero, Mike November Golf, and Ed DD5 Lima Papa for taking part in the news round table. Many thanks, guys, for joining us there. Uh, we'd also like to thank everybody that came along and said hello to us at the Cats Bazaar Rally uh, just uh, two weeks ago. Really did enjoy that event and we had a lot of fun, didn't we, Dad? And, uh, you know, we uh, will certainly try and get there again next year because it certainly is a, a lovely little uh, community uh, type of rally there in South London. So, uh, yeah, thanks to everybody there for uh, for welcoming us. Yeah, certainly was a great rally, Colin. Uh, got lots of chance to talk to people. Uh, we, we we were demonstrating what we do. Uh, there's still people who are not sure what we do. And in fairness, I got um, picked up to do a club talk on the uh, digital talk group that we've got set up. So uh, that's uh, all sorts of things come out of Cats. But Cats Bazaar is one of, to me, is probably the best uh, rally in South London uh, that's worth going to. So uh, there you go, Colin. There you go. Well, I hope we see more people there next year. Right, well, we're going to wrap this episode up, episode number 418 of your ICQ podcast. Uh, all we left to do is to, uh, to find out if there was any of those chocolate biscuits left over. I bought mum from uh, Ireland uh, two weeks ago, but I'm guessing they might all be gone now, so you might need to find uh, some new biscuits to go along with that cup of tea for mum. Yeah, we'll find your mum something, mate, in the cupboard. The bat will be something in the cupboard and we'll find her something that she'll enjoy. So no problems. I'll go off and make the cup of tea now, Colin. No problems at all. Well, I bid you and our listeners uh, 73s and we'll look forward to catching up with you again in a fortnight's time. 73s all. Yeah, 73.